perfectly. Thank you. Uh, across the past two years, we've been able to get some schools here. We have John Hopkins, like I mentioned, Darden, London Business School, Terry College of Business, just to mention a few. Uh, Lean members have been able to get admission into some of the schools that you can see displayed here. So there's a very big representation across the world for us. This is something we pride ourselves in at the city of Lane. Today, we have the privilege and honor to have the Assistant Director of Recruitment and Admissions, University of Toronto, that's the Rothman School of Business with us. That's Chris Jones, he's been here since 8.05, amazing man. Thank you. He's saying hello to every one of us. And we have Dotson Ogunlela and Uluwa Femi. I'm not sure I've seen Femi on the call. I'm sure he's going to be here very shortly. So they are going to be our speakers for today. Let's get started. The attendance form is going to be shared later on. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that Chris can get started right away. Okay, everybody, sorry, I'm just uh, doing my screen there. And um, just as I'm about to start, my dog started barking. So that's like your classic. Uh, that happens, doesn't it? He's He's been quiet all afternoon. And the minute I'm asked to start my share screen, my dog starts barking. So I apologies. I'm at home this afternoon. So apologies if my, my dog starts barking. Okay, so um, thanks so much to, to Lane. Thanks so much to uh, Franklin, Temi and uh, Elizabeth for inviting uh, the University of Toronto to talk to you all today. It's really great to be here and uh, to talk to you a little bit about the University of Toronto, the Rotman MBA program, uh, and of course, you know, some tips and tricks on, you know, what would make a good application? How can you get into our MBA? And I also have two of my um, yeah. students here today. So um, just bear with me a second. Um, so we have two students with us today. They're currently in their second year. So why don't I get them to introduce themselves very briefly um, before we get started with the presentation. So Dotan, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you're from and um, yeah, what you've been up to at Rotman very briefly. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, so my name is Dotan. Um, I'm from Nigeria. Um, I've been a lawyer for 11 years now. And having spent a decade um, lawyering, um, I thought that I, I would love to get a feel of more of the business side of things. And that's where um, the idea to come to Rubman came in. Um, and so the journey has been great so far, um, learning a lot, um, doing a lot. Um, I just interned at McKinsey and Company for the summer. So um, that's it for now. Thank you. All right, uh, Femi. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Demi. Okay, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Uluwa Femi. People call me Femi, of course. Also from Nigeria. Uh, so proud to the MBA. I was solely in the CPG space. So I work for a couple of companies like um, Penorica in Nigeria and um, Procter & Gamble. All my career was in um, sales, account management, business development. Yeah, so um, I currently work as a product manager in the fintech space here in Toronto. And yes, looking forward to sharing experiences and just answering any questions anybody might have here. Thanks for having us. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. So uh, what we're gonna do, I, I know this is a session is around sort of tips and tricks and you know how to ace a, an application, but I think, you know, it's always really important to talk a little bit about, um, you know, our university, right? Because some of you on the call here may not be too aware of, First of all, opportunities in Canada. So again, we are, I think, the first Canadian school that you have had an opportunity to talk to. And so we want to celebrate uh, and share a little bit about what makes it great to come to Canada to be a student. And then more importantly, uh, Toronto, right, as a city. So let's, why don't we start with Toronto, right? So I think this is always a good way to start because 
One of the things I think is really key when you when you consider an MBA program overseas is, yes, you want to go to a school with a good reputation. And we appreciate that. And that's going to provide you with the best education. But you also have to say to yourself, where am I going to live? Like, where am I also going to if I'm leaving Africa, where am I going to live? What sort of city or town do I want to live in? What type of culture environment do I want to be part of? Right. And is it going to be somewhere where moving home to a different country somewhere that you're going to feel comfortable, right? And we absolutely feel Toronto is a fantastic place for people to come to uh, if they're looking for an overseas experience. Um, one of the things I think is always really important is that obviously we're the largest Canadian city, um, but Toronto is a huge hub uh, within North America, right? So let's not, we never want to lose sight of the fact of how important and how strategic Toronto is across North America. So second largest financial centre after New York, third largest a technology and innovation center as well in North America. And a lot of large global organizations now have headquarters in Toronto, right? So seeing a lot of new HQs for so people like Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, for example, right? And that presents opportunities, um, so, which is also great. I think one of the things that I have loved myself about living in Toronto, because I'm actually from the UK, so I'm also someone who has moved here and made a life in, in Canada is Toronto is probably the most multicultural city in the world. So really, we like to think that wherever you come from, you can make Toronto your home. It's extremely diverse. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's an, hopefully an easier place for you to assimilate into if you're from Africa coming here. Um, so no matter what food you like, what restaurants you like, there is something here for everybody in Toronto. And with that, of course, comes, you know, being a multicultural city, you know, it's also very safe. Um, and it's considered one of the most livable cities in the world. So when you look at those like top 10 best cities in the world to live in, right, and you look at those rankings, you will always find Toronto in the top 10, right? So again, there's also a lifestyle choice that you're picking coming here as well, right? So I think that's uh, something always really key is think about, think of where you want to live your life, right? For either for two years, or of course, if you're coming to Canada, it's a lot easier to stay um, once you graduate, right? The other, the other advantage of choosing Canada as a location. So um, one of the things that makes uh, U of T or Rotman really great, of course, is we're also located in downtown Toronto. So this kind of photograph here really gives you a good idea of you know, what where we are in relation to the city, right? We are really close to the action. We're at the heart of the action. So the idea, of course, is if you move here, you, you pretty much, this is it. You don't need to move again after your MBA to move to a different town or city or location uh, to work, right? Everything is right here for you. Um, so our location, we think, is very advantageous to our students. Um, we're very close to where, you know, again, where all the jobs are. So Bay Street is kind of like our Wall Street or, you know, the city that you might have in London. Um, and naturally, although there's a lot of financial services jobs uh, downtown, a lot of other FinTech technology companies um, are also located very close to our university. And this is just a snapshot of some of the brands that actively recruit our students across industries. Many you will recognize, some you will see, uh, particularly within financial services are more Canadian banks, right? But the Canadian banks dominate the financial services landscape here in Canada, and they offer a lot of great opportunities uh, for our students in a wide variety of roles, which is also really interesting. So what I'd like to do is, as I go through this presentation, is also give you a snapshot of some of our graduates. You have current students on the call today who can talk to you about their lived experience in the program. It's always good to get a sense of what have some of our African uh, alumni been doing uh, in the since they've graduated. So I'm featuring three 2020 grads here today. Um, first one is Temi. Uh, he's from Nigeria. Um, and obviously he is working in financial services and is currently a manager um, in credit risk. So again, um, already in a pretty senior leadership role at TD Bank here in Toronto, just two years after graduation. So let's talk a little bit about the university as well. If reputation and rankings are important to you, then obviously the University of Toronto ticks all those boxes, right? We are the number one school in Canada. We're a top 20 school globally. So even if your MBA takes you to a different country or back home after you've graduated, the University of Toronto is always very highly recognized across the world, right? And we're number six outside of the US uh, university ranking. So I won't go through all these stats, but it just gives you an idea of 
if these if this information is important to you, you know, University of Toronto has got a fantastic reputation, right? Um, so here's another one of our, our alum. Um, this is Desola. She is works in finance. So initially started out in investment and, and did investment banking in one of our big banks. But of course, as many of us, our grads do, they change jobs quite quickly because they, they see opportunities here in Toronto. And now she's working in more of a, uh, a finance role within a startup in healthcare. So really interesting to see our students move from large institutions um, out of MBA very quickly into smaller startup um, or spaces as well, um, which I think also just gives you a sense of the sort of opportunities. Um, and again, DeSola was from Nigeria. So we do have many students here from, from the this region. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about the, you know, what does the Rotman MBA experience actually look like for you? Uh, so again, it's essentially a two-year MBA. So you're going to commit to a two-year program with us. Um, it's really kind of, I guess, 20 months when you're actually a student. So you start in August, and then you would finish almost two years later at the end of April, early May. So 16 months of study and then four months of your time with us, you would be doing an internship, which is full time paid. So, again, as we said, Doton was at McKinsey for the summer and Femi was at uh, Sim Simply Financial, where he's now stayed on in a part time role with his second year, which is kind of interesting how some of our students continue their internships on a part time basis when they return to school. So, you know, what's really great is it's a mandatory requirement for our program. So it, it, it ensures that you get some work experience, typically in Canada, where most of our students want to work. Um, it gets you valuable Canadian work experience, and it can also then lead you to full time opportunities when you graduate here in Toronto. Um, it's flexible, so you can either do it in the summer, which is when most students will want to do their internships. It's a natural break between first and second year. But you can, can do it in the fall or the winter of your second year if you choose. Of course, if you are not working in the summer, you would have to begin your second year electives early, right? Because you can't do two internships. Um, Doton, why don't you tell us a little bit about how the second year of, of your MBA works? First year is a core curriculum that everybody has to do. But in the second year, you can. it's very flexible. So why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your experience so far and the electives, what you picked, how it works. Yeah. Um, so for the second year, I mean, the good thing is after the rigor of the first year, things are a bit lighter and you have a lot more flexibility. Um, unlike in the first year where you have to do mostly core courses, in the second year, you are liberty to choose whatever electives you want, um, depending on your interest or depending on maybe the feedback that you got from prior years about how great the course was. Um, and how it really works is that um, a couple of months before the start of the year or the term, you are basically shown all the possible electives you have, uh, which are, I don't know, maybe about 30 something or thereabout. And then you, um, you pick the ones you want. So imagine if you need to, if you're interested in taking four electives, for example, um, you should pick options of about eight, double the, the number of what you want. And then you rank in order of the ones you want, you absolutely must have your top favorites and all of that. And then you put in the system, we have a platform for that. And you eventually get the results back on what, you know, um, the, your, your eventual electives are. And the good thing is that you, if you, you end up not getting some electives that you really absolutely wanted, you can do, there's a system called add and drop. So you say, or oh, you either want to add something else or you want to drop another course. So there's a lot of flexibility going on in the second year. And because for example, in my case, I'm, I'm transitioning to consulting. So I'm very heavy on the strategies for consulting courses. Um, I'm doing um, a course called management consulting practicum. I'm doing a corporate strategy course. I'm doing um, a course called Corporation 360, which has a, a, bit, a lot of sustainability in it, which is really, I mean, this 2022, that's the direction the world is going, going is in and going to now. Um, so, so far the courses have been interesting. In fact, at one of the courses I'm also doing international world of business in the economy. Um, there is a, there's an element of travel in it. So we could go to Barcelona for, to meet with like a trade mission. So there are a lot of exciting opportunities that open up in the second year, um, even more than in the first year. So that's it. 
All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Doton, for sharing that. Okay, so again, just another example of one of our uh, alum from a couple of years ago, Uju, um, currently working as a manager, a product manager for one of our Canadian banks. Um, so again, it goes to show there's lots of great opportunities outside of just purely finance in many of our financial institutions. Um, and again, you know, she was very interested in innovation, leadership, um, opportunities to get into sort of marketing and, the, and kind of creative jobs. And I think Rotman also offers a lot of great courses that allow you to um, get involved in more of that kind of creative side post MBA. Um, OK, so now we're going to talk a little bit about Speaking of sort of innovation, I think one thing that's really key, if there are people on this call here or webinar who are interested in entrepreneurship and innovation and making, you know, maximizing, you know, Toronto's position as a key innovation and startup hub in North America, then obviously one of the things we have at Rotman is called our Creative Destruction Lab. Um, it basically started about 12 years ago here at Rotman, and it's still Rotman is the, is the base for the Creative Destruction Lab. It's an opportunity really for um, early stage startups to apply to join a nine month uh, venture program where they, they come to Rotman and they join the CDL and they look to find ways in which they can scale up their business and to try and bring a product to market, right? So a lot of, the, um, a lot of it focuses on scalable technology um, and there's a, lot of there's a lot of focus on sort of healthcare, um, the environment, energy, fintech. Um, and our students, of course, have an opportunity to participate in a CDL course that's offered as one of the electives in the second year where you would actually join one of those startups and become part of their business for nine months. Right. And you're there as a Rotman student to help them with all the things that they're not great at, which is uh, marketing strategy, you know, working on their finances, looking to see how they can raise capital, um, all the things that they need help for from, say, a business student, right? They have the great idea, but they don't have the business skills, right? So it's a really good practical course. Um, and so again, so lots of opportunity to get really involved in the innovation scene through Rotman, right? Um, I don't think Doton, great, she sort of touched a little bit there on the idea of sort of global experiences. But we do have a lot of opportunities for you to experience life outside of just Toronto in our program through global practicums, which are like small, what we call sometimes treks to Silicon Valley. We've done stuff in Spain. We've done things in New York. Um, there's also an exchange program that you can do in your second year if you want to. Um, and we work with a number of uh, partner universities, often in sort of uh, primarily in Europe, but all over the world as well. And then, of course, you have uh, global consulting projects. So doing business internationally, which is like a sort of two week project that you can go on, apply to go on. And we've been to places like South America, the Middle East, Northeast Asia. Um, and those work really well for students who can't really commit to a full semester living overseas especially if you've already come from Africa to Toronto, right? That may sometimes be a big leap to then go into another university in a different country. Um, so we do offer like short-term opportunities for you to travel and experience the world um, on a more global scale. Um, now I'm going to ask Femi to talk a little bit about this. So one of the things that I think sets Rotman apart from every other school, especially in North America, is our self-development lab. So that idea of experiential learning is really, really important. It's not just always about the academics, right? It's about what other skills can you learn and gain from Rotman that are so important to employers in North America, right? Technical skills are great, but you every applicant may have the right technical skills for a job. But in Canada in particular, often they'll hire you for your soft skills, right? In addition to those technical skills, that was what will win you the job through an interview process. So Femi, why don't you tell us a little about the self-development lab and uh, what it all means? Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, I don't know if you can recall when I was applying to Rotman, I don't know, you know, we had a chat then. And one of the things I said I was interested in then was the SDL and the LDL, right? So um, a, a bit of... Um, background so the sdl year at rotman it means the self-development lab and that i tell people is one of the major things that sets rotman apart and that was one of the things that actually attracted me to rotman itself so coming from nigeria having spent all my life in nigeria having worked all through in nigeria the transitioning was going to be a steep one and i needed a program that was going to give me the should i say the resources 
to actually easily transition into a different system entirely. And that's what uh, the self-development lab does. So we take practical modules on, um, like you can see on the slide, voicing yourself, self-management presentation. So I know it's like, Chris has said, everybody has the technical skills. You meet very smart people. And in Rotman, trust me, there's like smart people everywhere you go. But one thing the self-development lab does is actually takes you back a little and says, okay, what are the soft skills that actually help you excel? So you're coming to class and you're having a module or a session where they're teaching you on how to present. They're teaching you on the things to say and things not to say in the workplace, in the Canadian workforce. They're teaching you on how to make group work, how to give good feedback and get good feedback. So those kind of practical courses are things I really, really love about the self-development lab. And uh, I've seen it play out in my own life personally, of course, because I, I got the opportunity to work over the summer and I, I was able to actually put into practice some of the things I learned during the SDL courses. And in the second year, there's also the opportunity for the LDL, which is more advanced. So the LDL kind of, takes on students that are interested in owning um, or in taking up leadership positions in and outside Rotman. So for me, for perspective, I currently sit on the Graduate Business Council here at Rotman. So I, I am a vice president of um, events and socials for the entire Rotman community. And one of the things that prepared me for such a role was um, taking the SDL modules. And now I am also taking the LDL modules, right? Which pretty much just arms me with all the things I need to know about developing my leadership character, things I should be able to say, things I shouldn't say, how to do this, how to do that. So I think it's a very interesting thing. And the director of the lab itself, Dr. Maya, she's like one of the best people I've ever met. So when you actually listen to her speak, she tells you things and you're like, wow, I wish I actually knew that when I started my career or things like that. So if, it's, if you are very much interested in self-development, right, I feel the SDL and the LDL is way, way, way ahead of its game. And it's one thing that actually sets Rotman apart. I don't know. Yeah, if you have further questions on that, I can always answer, of course. All right. Thanks, Femi. That was great. Better way to describe it from someone who's living it, living the experience rather than, than me. OK, so let's talk a little bit about our class, right? So we are a very diverse class. We like to think that our class is a good representation of the city we live in, which is extremely diverse. Um, so I think this is also quite a useful slide for anyone on the call who's kind of trying to also assess okay where am I at here in my life my career is Rotman the right school for me and do I fit sort of the the profile because of course there is although we have a very broad admissions criteria naturally we have to there has to be like a limit in kind of who we take and what's important I think one of the key things for anyone on this call to understand is our average age right so it's very clear on there that if you are over, you know, if you're older than sort of 35, 36, you prob this is probably not the right program for you. You will need to look at more executive programs at that point, right? Because this program is still geared more towards people at earlier stages of their career. Um, so, you know, I think that that's key. So like obviously Doton has 10 years, that's probably Doton, you, you squeezed in just to the right time, I think there. Um, but yeah, I would say anything from sort of, I would say from this region, anything from sort of obviously two to 10 years is probably a good fit for candidates from Africa. We would encourage you to get at least three or four years work experience before you apply as well, because inevitably to get a good job out of MBA, it's a combination of your previous work experience in Africa, which is absolutely accepted and valued here in Canada, as well as the MBA. So obviously the average in our program is around five years when you look at our students globally. You can see here that, you know, we'll talk about GMATs and GREs in a minute. Those are a requirement for our program. So you can see the average GMAT and then you can kind of see where the number of students at the low end, which is sort of 500 to 580, where people sit in the middle. Um, and then obviously, obviously, we do have some students with exceptional GMAT scores, which is great. Never a bad thing for anyone. You can see as well that we also have a relatively we try to have a close mix of domestic and international students. We're skewing higher on international students at the moment, which is totally fine, but we do have a good solid group of Canadians. So again, if you wanna to come to a country where there is gonna be local students in your program, you know, Rotman is a great opportunity school for that. It's very popular with uh, domestic students. And of course, we're always working towards a gender balance. So at the moment, 
we have around 45% women in both our classes, first and second year. So we're looking to work towards that gender equality as well. So that kind of gives you an idea of sort of basically where you should be looking to fit and, you know, what the average class profile looks like. Obviously, people from all over the world, of course. Um, now, obviously, your career and career outcomes are extremely important for MBAs, right? This is not an undergrad where you're necessarily going to be like, oh, I'm going to figure it out for four years and see what happens. You know, from day one, you're going to be focused, right, on not only your studies, but also career outcomes. So obviously, you know, we have a lot of resources available to help. Um, our employment three months after graduation is 96 percent. Uh, that was for last year. We're just getting stats now for this year, and it's close to, again, around 95%. So that's what's great is that I would say 95% of those 95% are living and working in Toronto. Because, again, all our international students get it. Uh, as long as you finish the MBA, you get a three-year graduate work permit, which allows you to work freely, move jobs as much as you want, no issues with sponsorship or visas. You can do what you like, move around. Uh, for three years after graduation. And that is why Canada is an extremely popular and risk-free destination if you're looking to work in the location that you are studying in. And for many of our international students or alumni, they will begin the process of applying for permanent residency in Canada during the, either the, during the MBA or in those three years. And it's practically a guarantee that you'll get it because you will have uh, a master's degree from a Canadian institution, right? So you're not then having to look for after three years, a company to still sponsor you, right? If you're, if, and so very straightforward, that's how I came to Canada. And now I'm a Canadian citizen, but I also still have my British citizenship too. So Canada allows you to have multiple citizenships as well. So think about the advantages there. I think obviously Femi and, and Doton, both told me yesterday that those were key factors as well in picking Canada is that kind of risk free right to enable you to live and work overseas uh, without um, any pressure right to return if you don't want to. Um, and again, after an MBA, you're probably going to want to earn Canadian or whatever US dollars right you want to earn the currency because um, obviously it's, it's, you know, it's uh, Canadian dollars relatively strong actually at the moment com compared to certainly the pound. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about student clubs. So lots of great like industry clubs, and I won't list them all because I do want to keep moving along here. Obviously, we have industry clubs run by students for pretty much everything. Um, but what I'd love to do is for Doton or Femi, one of you to tell us a little bit about the Rackback, which is our cultural club, which I think many of our uh, participants would be interested in here as they're from Africa. Femi, you want to go or should I? Okay, um, so the Rugback is the um, Rubman African and Caribbean Business Club for African and Caribbean students. Uh, and basically, it's a club where, of course, I mean, in terms of like um, our ethnicity and our uh, race, we have that strong allyship. Um, and they, they are welcome events that um, the club organizes from the point when um, students are admitted in a new year. Um, and basically, there are many things in terms of like providing support. There are many benefits in terms of one, of course, providing support, because it can be quite jarring um, coming from any country in Africa or outside Canada for that matter. And then you are quickly sucked into this entire new world. You are doing a very intensive MBA program, you know, trying to get your feet and trying to settle in. Um, it can be quite a lot. Um, of course, with the rigor of the academic curriculum and, and also looking at your career opportunities. So that support is there. Um, any advice you need, anything from how to navigate the, um, the program itself to like, oh yeah, where can I find cheap winter jackets? Or, or who, who knows the plug for like great jollof rice in Toronto? You know, things like that. Like we have that community um, and then, of course, you know, we organize um, events every now and then, you know, we bring out the nice Afrobeat playlist and just enjoy ourselves. Um, so, so that's it um, about the club on a very high level. Chris, I think you're on mute. Chris, you're on mute. 
All right, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so we're moving along now. Um, obviously, employment is really key and money is really great after an MBA where obviously you may have some loans or some, you know, obviously it's uh, um, grad programs are expensive in, in North America. Uh, we don't hide that fact and we don't hide the cost of the MBA. Um, but this gives you kind of an idea of, you know, very average averages, kind of salaries that you can earn when you first graduate, um, the kind of salary that you can earn uh, per month during your internship. So again, our internships are up to four months in length. So absolutely is a great way to um, help pay the bills, as it were, and um, not eat into your savings when you're in your internship. Again, internship salaries never are a reflection of what you could earn full time in, in, in those organizations because they're just an internship. Um, so it gives you an idea in Canadian dollars here, you know, some of the salaries. Again, some will be higher and some will be lower. So we've just given you the average here. Right. And obviously, there's a lot of help from our career center in order to make sure that you secure those great internships. Right. So. Um, uh, why don't we, Doton, why don't you tell us again very briefly, you know, how you kind of utilize the Career Center and then how did sort of, you know, how did McKinsey come to campus? How did all that sort of work for you? Okay. Um, my career coach, I absolutely love. I always tell anyone who is willing to, to mm -hmm. listen. Um, and she basically, I, I think what helped wasn't just the fact that she was very willing to help and provide great advice. But also, I was intentional about seeking for, for help. Uh, and I had my first touch point with her within the first, I think, two weeks of, of, of starting the program. Uh, and ju just to get to, just to tell her a bit about myself, my background, my interests, direction I'm, I was willing to go and all of that. And then I just told her, which, um, funny story, Chris, I don't know if you mm -hmm. remember doing um, the interviews again to Rob Matt, I mentioned, oh yeah, I won't mind working in McKinsey, right? Um, so I mentioned that um, to her during our first meeting that um, consulting, I was looking at consulting because um, I knew I wanted to transition away from law, having spent the last 10 years in law before my MBA. And then I also knew I wanted to transition away from oil and gas, which was where I spent the last seven years before my MBA. And so um, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to transition to. And that's where the idea of going into consulting came about um, to be able to get a feel of different industries, different functions, and to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and when the, when the time came, they, so the different firms, the different companies, they come into the whole um, on-campus events. And so McKinsey had, I think, two on-campus events, and I made sure I attended them, even the other MBBs and other um, um, firms that I was interested in. Um, and it's important to attend these events because they actually track um, they actually track attendance. And from there, when the um, role vacancy came out, I applied and I got in and here we are. So All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, and, and I believe Doton, you did, uh, Rotman students competed with lots of students from, from big schools in the US. And uh, I think we did pretty well, don't you think? Yeah, so yes, yes. I mean, think of every single Ivy League um, that comes to mind from the US. Uh, we are all in the same pool competing for these roles um, in, in McKinsey. And um, thankfully, we did really, really well. Um, Rodman um, candidates did very well. All right. Good to know. Good to know. All right. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Femi. Maybe at the end, if we got some time, you can share how you got your internship because Femi obviously did it a little bit more independently, which we also encourage as well, right? So independent search is never a bad thing either. Um, okay, so here it is, uh, the dreaded tuition fees. So again, like I said, we're not going to hide anything. We're not going, you know, it, it's we're very open about how much it costs for our program. We are you know, it is, uh, it is expensive. Um, so what you can see here is the fees for international students, uh, which many of you may be, but if you do have your Canadian permanent residency and you're looking to come to Canada, you would pay domestic fees. So always worth thinking about for anyone on this call who's in the pool for permanent residency for Canada. Uh, it's worth uh, getting that first before you come here. You wouldn't require a study permit and you would pay domestic fees, which are a lot less. 
For international students, you can see what the fees are in Canadian and then US dollars. So again, it's a good way for you maybe to compare the cost against US schools with looking at the US dollar price tag, right? Obviously we offer scholarships, right? So again, I think a lot of questions, there will be a lot of questions around funding maybe towards the end. So let's see if we can address some of those up front before we go into our tips and tricks. So all you have to do to be eligible for an entrance award and a scholarship at Rotman is apply to the program, right? You don't have, there's no separate application, you just apply to our program. Um, and what we do is we like to award scholarships based on strength of your application, right? And we'll talk a little bit in the tips and tricks on what would make a great application, but there are no separate applications, you just apply, right? Put your best foot forward and the admissions committee will decide at that point whether there's a scholarship opportunity and how much, okay? Um, we like to, where we can, award as much as we can to candidates from the Africa region. And hopefully Doton and Femi will know that I do everything in my power to advocate for you and do everything I can to try and make sure that uh, we reduce the financial burden for you through scholarships. They're basically tuition reductions, right? That's really what an entrance award is. Um, and so again, on average, it can be anything from sort of 10 to 50% of tuition. So that kind of gives you sort of the averages at Rotman, right? I think you may find for grad schools, um, compared to say undergrads overseas, um, you know, full scholarships are available. And again, you're, you're, you're in the pool for those as well, but obviously they're a little smaller in numbers um, than the kind of average, right? So again, even if you're looking for a full scholarship, you've just got to apply like everybody else. There's no separate application, right? And every year we've been able to offer full scholarships or close to full scholarships uh, to uh, candidates from Africa. Um, again, it's all going to be based on the strength of your application. Um, okay, so with that, um, uh, Temi, obviously, this is a bit of a sort of we've done the information session. This is kind of maybe this is what people signed up for. Um, but hey, we get an opportunity to, to showcase and uh, boast about Rotman. We're going to do it right. But this is kind of um, what you asked us to do. So here's a little bit of a sort of tips and tricks on um you know, what's going to make a really good application, a strong application, I would say, to Rotman and probably any MBA program uh, overseas. And hopefully Femi and Doton can uh, can jump in with some of their stories as well about the application process. And then obviously we can open up for questions. Um, OK, so let's talk, of course. I'm assuming, Temi, as well, that most people on here will be aware that you require a GMAT or a GRE uh, to apply to grad school or business school anywhere in North America and probably Europe as well. Um, and that's the same at Rotman. You need to write either one or the other. Um, the only way that you would be exempt or you can waive a GMAT or GRE is if you are have a CFA, you're a CFA charter holder or you have your CFA three. Or alternatively, this year, we're also opening up um, GRE waivers if you've got your CFA2 as well. So that's a new development this year. It's so new, it's not even on my slide. Um, so for those people who have passed all two levels, and of course, three levels, um, you do not need to write a GMAT or a GRE. So hopefully that will encourage people to submit an application. Naturally, what I would say to you is for those who, who are charter holders, of course, your application will be stronger. That, that's a reality, right? Compared to a CFA2, but a CFA2 will still present a strong application. Um, let me to give you a sense of like, you know, people always go, I've given you the average GMATs on the screen. What's, do we have a minimum requirement? We don't really have a minimum requirement, but again, what you have to say to yourself is if your GMAT is certainly under 600, right, or your GRE is under sort of a 315. And what it does is it just unfortunately is going to impact scholarship opportunities. You know, it may not necessarily impact you getting in unless the GMAT is so low that it represents an academic risk for us. Um, you know, so you have to you have to be honest and truthful with yourself about your GMAT or your GRE score, right? So, again, you may not receive high as, as such high scholarships if your GMAT or GRE is lower. But I will. It's not everything, right? It's not everything. So let's talk about all the other things. Obviously, you must have a post secondary education. You must have a university degree. That is a minimum requirement in addition to the GMAT or GRE, right? Um, and I would say you want to be averaging a B or a B plus 
in your final year of studies, right? It's a three at, on a four point scale at U of T. That's just our own grading scale. Again, so if you were struggling in your undergrad, it could be a red flag for us as well, right? Because again, this is an academic program. We need to be sure that you can get through the academic rigor. And as Doughton alluded to, first year is very academically rigorous, right? So you don't want to come here and fail, right? And we don't want that to happen. So English proficiency, this is a question that came up in my webinar yes, the other, the other day with some other African uh, potential candidates. If you are from uh, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Zimbabwe, places like that, I think anywhere where English is commonly spoken language or where you have completed your, your university degree in English, right? You do not need to write an IELTS or a TOEFL test. Um, if you are from uh, a country where maybe it's Spanish or French is more commonly spoken and English is not your first language and you didn't study your university degree in English, you may be required to write one, but that's kind of case by case basis. And you can email me and we can kind of talk about that. OK, um, so it does vary. But for most of our candidates from Africa where English is commonly spoken, you don't. So certainly if you're from Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, you do not need to write one. OK, so that's waived for us. Um, OK, resume. So, again, we look for work experience. It's very, very, very important. Right. When you're applying to an MBA program, again, I, I would say anywhere in the world, work experience is very valuable. OK, you will leverage that work experience when you come to Rotman. And I can pretty much certain that Femi and Doton still had to utilize that work experience or the transferable skills that you have from that experience to get your internships. Guys, would you agree that your work experience was still important at Rotman? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Spot on, Chris. It was very, very important because um, I think when I was interviewing for my role, one of the things I kept coming up was how will I be able to transfer my experience working on products, working with people, managing stakeholders to the same new role, yeah. So I think at the end of the day, like you rightly said, the work experience is going to actually set you apart because employers are looking for what have you done, then how are you able to complement what you've done with what you've learned in Rotman to actually prefer good solutions, pretty much. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Femi. So one of the things you want to emphasize on your resume, right, is what are your accomplishments, right? Here's some good tips, right? What have you done and what are your achievements, right? Can you show results in those bullet points on your resume, right? Can you show accomplishments rather than just a description of what you did in your job, right? These are all things that will help you with. We will also help you in the career center when you get to Rotman, right? Is you know really kind of drilling down and going, okay, what did you do? What were the achievement? What was the results? So can you show you know, can you show statistical results if, if you're in kind of more of a sales or quant job, right? Um, can you show us leadership? Have you grown in your career over the three to 10 years that you've worked in, right? Or have you just had like lateral moves? So any of you who are higher on the experience side, so for example, when we, when I, sorry, Doton, I'm going to use your, when we were reviewing Doton's application, she had a lot of work experience. So it was absolutely essential that she could show that if, you've, if you're coming to Rotman with 10 years, you need to show career progression, right? Um, and so obviously she was an amazing candidate and uh, she showed all those, those qualities, right? So we were able to you know, bring her into the program. So again, especially if you're on the higher experience side, you want to say to yourself, okay, what have I done, right? You, you have to have pretty, pretty good experience with 10 years behind you. We also look at extracurricular, so volunteer, community involvement, leadership roles, um, all those things add to your resume as well, right? So we love to see what else makes you interesting to us other than your work experience, right? Get all that on your resume and try and keep your resumes one or two pages as well, right? Which may require some of you to cut stuff, but we don't really care about things you did in high school, for example, right? So, um, you know, don't be afraid to cut things from your resume to keep it short because that's what people want to see in Canada. So let's talk a little bit about spike factor, okay? Because Rotman has a very unique essay that we ask you to write. We like to think it's kind of fun and sets us apart from other schools and maybe gives you an idea of the Rotman culture and community. So Femi, putting you on the spot here. Um, tell us a little about Spike Factor essay. 
<laughs> okay, you're putting me on the spot, Chris. <laughs> let, let, let me try to take a stab at it. Yeah, I think I've had conversations with different people, and every time the spike factor essay comes up, I always put it this way. I say, what makes the Rotman application different is they genuinely want to know you. And I think that's what the spike factor essay is about. It's about what makes you you, right? It's that unique attribute that you uh, possess so it's the when 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 you want to write the spike essay and um, the spike factor essay i tell people to think of it more or less like okay if i'm going to write a documentary about myself what will be the content of the documentary right so what will be the content of my is it the autobiography or whatever so what's the recurring theme that you can find in your personal life in your academic life in your professional life that recurring thing that stands out. So what's that thing that you can draw that single line? So be it in a professional setting, when you ask people about me, this is what they'll say, keeps me different, makes me different. Take it to the same profession, to the academic setting, just the same thing that sets me about. So when you think about it that way, it doesn't necessarily have to be work-related or professional-related. I have classmates where I'm sure, the, the, I was talking to a couple of my classmates, some people had their spike factors were about the fact that they, they love hiking, about the fact that they were photographers, about the fact that they they love cooking. You get so it's just anything that just makes you you, anything that makes you stand apart from the rest. Because trust me, thousands of people will apply, thousands of people will write essays. But at the end of the day, you want your essay to be that thing where people are talking and they're like, oh, I came across this essay. This person said this so interesting thing. I want us to interview this person. I want us to learn more about what this person does, right? So when you want to think about the essay, just think about that story that really illustrates your passion, illustrates your grit, resilience, drive, or whatever the case might be. Anything that just sets you apart and makes you memorable. That's how you should think of the Spike Factor essay when you're thinking about it. All right. Uh, thanks. Um, so yeah, you guys had good good essays. Um, so again, in the interest of time, uh, sorry, Doton, I, I, I'm just going to move on. Um, so again, that, that's definitely some good tips and tricks there if you're looking to apply to Rotman or again, any other school that may ask you for, you know, something different than just like, what are your career goals after your MBA, which, you know, everyone gets bored of writing that right for the hundredth application. OK, um, so one of the things we also have at Rotman, and you may have this at other universities, too, is they ask you to sort of do like a video response. So you know, you, you use like an online tool and you talk into your your camera on your laptop and you have to answer some sort of questions. Um, so we have that as well, because, of course, as Femi said, lots of applications, we don't always get to meet every single applicant before they apply. So it's a great way for us to kind of see you and experience your communication skills and how you sort of present yourself uh, in front of the camera. It's very easy, it doesn't take long, and it's something you do once you've completed the application and you've submitted it. Um, doesn't require a whole lot of prep. And, um, you know, what happens is you tend to get questions like, okay, what's your favorite city and why? Like if you, if you could invite anyone to dinner who's not in your family, who would you invite and why? So questions that you don't really need to prep for, but they're kind of like pop psychology questions. Um, and then there's a written response that we guess you do, which is more like a, writing an email or a LinkedIn post. And it's just, again, a way for us to assess your written English without using sort of grammar correction tools and things like that. I'm going to go through this very quickly now. There is an interview. Uh, obviously, we ask for references. Um, try and use professional references. Um, somebody that you have that's reported that you've reported to, but it doesn't have to be like the CEO of your company, right? Just anyone that you've worked with who maybe there's been some sort of reporting. Um, it could be someone you've worked with, again, outside of work. So you're working for a charity and there's someone still that's kind of senior to you that would be able to make a, um, some good positive comments about your performance. Uh, references for us are really easy. You just submit the person's email in your application. That person then gets like an online survey. They answer the questions. They hit submit, send it back, right? So they don't have to write like a proper letter. They just complete a questionnaire. And then the last piece is an interview, which if you're from Africa, it would be with me. So hi, everybody. If you if you get through to interview, you're going to be interviewing with me. Doton and Femi interview with me. They can tell you that I grilled them and it was the hardest interview ever. So don't, 
Okay, Dota, I'm lying, I hope. Tell us a little bit about the admissions interview at Rockman and some tips for the, for an interview. Uh, first things first, um, try and control your nerves. Very important. Like I remember my palms were getting really sweaty um, right before I started. But you know, Chris was pretty chill. And then also, yeah, you know, coming from Nigeria, you know, there are a lot of things running through my mind. Like, oh my God, I hope Nepal doesn't take it. Like, we're on gentral. And then Invata was there on standby. Like everything, well, I was just trying to make sure internet, there was like hotspot, extra Wi Fi, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so those things that may distract you or throw you off, just try and take, take, take that away. But uh, more importantly, come with your full authentic self. I mean, towards the end of the interview, Chris and I were bantering about he supports West Brom, I support mine, we were bantering about that at the end. Um, because, you know, I tried to make sure that um, I came and made my personality shine through, right? Um, you get asked, of course, the main focus would be questions about what you've done, your career. Um, and because like Chris mentioned, um, I had 10 years under my belt, so there was quite a bit I could, I could speak about. But even if you've had what well, just three, four years experience, I mean, there'll be a number of things, areas where you have um, been impactful at work. So you make sure that you showcase those to show leadership, to show all of that. Um, and then of course, come prepared to ask questions, to ask good questions. Um, whether you need to know more about um, a particular um, course that, that what man offers, or you need to know more about um, living in Toronto, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to say. All right, thanks, Doton. Yeah, and I think, you know, our admissions interviews, as you can see, I think my style is similar to what I'd like to think that you're experiencing today. We don't, it, it's not, we're not there to trick you or to make you make mistakes. It's not a stress interview. It's it's a it's a classic sort of typical sort of behavioral interview where we don't ask technical questions. We just ask you questions about, you know, obviously why Rotman, some some questions around your work experience, and then maybe some questions around sort of thoughtfulness. You know, what do you think about sort of stuff like this? How do you interact with sort of people from diverse teams and things like that and adapting to to life in an MBA program, right? So it's it's very um it's very conversational and whether it's me or someone else on our team unlikely because I, I look after all applicants from this region um we try and make you feel relaxed and again Dote and I at the end we just talked about football but at the end of the day we're creating a relationship right we're building rapport and for me I was like this is great right she's going to be great in our program because I know she can build rapport not only with me but with anybody um and even though she supports Man United we still we still admitted her so if it was tough. I was like, I had, to, I had to think twice. All right. Um, jokes aside. OK, so uh, Temi or uh, Elizabeth or um, Franklin, we're kind of at the end of our presentation and we have, you know, a little bit of time here for, for Q&A. Um, if anybody has um, any questions, if not, obviously, our, our students are happy to sort of talk a little bit about their sort of journey from, OK, how did I? If you want us to do that as well, they're happy to give you that sort of sense of where they started out, how they got, you know, how they figured out funding. We're pretty open here to answer questions that we feel the audience might want uh, to hear. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to try and not answer too many of them because I think it's really good for you to hear from your peer group. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Dotson. Thank you, Femi. It's been a very enlightening session. You know, the part where it's important for us to make our personality shine through the process of admission. It's something that really stood out for me. Um, straight up, there are a couple of hands up for question already. So I'm going to let Tuchuku go ahead. Tuchuku, I've asked for you to unmute. You can ask your question. Oh, thank you very much now. Hi, Chris. Hello. Thank you very much. Very informative session. I, I, I was you were answering every question I had in mind as it was <laughs> coming, but, but there was a part I really needed to get clarity on. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I saw I saw the list of the different clubs, and you mentioned a little about entrepreneurship um, being part of the focus in Toronto and how it's a, a great thriving community for building startups and all and being funded. Mm. I'm interested in the entrepreneurship part, and but I want to do entrepreneurship around tech, around technology. So I, I want to hear more about 
tech entrepreneurship in that space? How, what's open? How is the funding? And how receptive is the Rotman Business School to people coming in and focusing in tech? Because I see most of the alumni, um, I don't know, maybe unfortunately, the ones I've connected with on LinkedIn are all into finance and consulting, management consulting, but not into the tech, tech hard skills per se. So I want to know about that side. Yeah, it's a great question. And Doton and Femi, unless you want to take this, um, I can answer this question around tech. So I think I can start. Uh, yeah, okay, great. <clears throat> I can just take a stab at it. Yeah, hi, Tochuku again. Uh, what's it got? So talking about the entrepreneurship, and I, I, I don't think it was on the slide, but there's this, um, there's a club in Rotman called the Refka, if I'm not mistaken. So it's the Rotman Entrepreneurship and Venture Capital Association. And funny story or interesting story, the last two presidents have been Nigerians. Yeah, and uh, Rotimi was the president last year and the current president is um, Fumi. Yeah, her name is Fumi. She used to run a couple of organizations back home in Nigeria and she's also continuing in that, in that light here, right? So in terms of entrepreneurship and people choosing to focus on tech, the FIT, which is the flexible internship term Chris was talking about, where you have four months to go work with an organization or do things. So I have classmates that spend those four months figuring out strategy for their startups, right? I have a classmate that has a startup out of um, the US. He spent the last four months of the summer in the US pretty much just working around his business strategy and how to take it to market so that he gets himself ready for the whole funding round next year, right? So you have, there's a lot of room to do things like that. And Chris made mention of the CDL, which is the Creative Destruction Lab. It's more or less like an incubator for startups. So you see a lot of people go through this incubator pro pro program, right? Where they tend to just work on their startup for the next six months, eight months, one year, just building it up. And you have access to like funding, have access to a lot of alumni. There are a pretty a number of um, Rotman alums that have their own startup. So I'm taking a course in Rotman right now. It's called um, FinTech Marketing. It's a course being taught by one of the great professors. So if any one of you gets into Rotman, that's one course I would definitely recommend. It's called FinTech Marketing. So something we do in that course is we have founders come in every other week to talk to us about their startup, right? What they do, how they do, how Rotman has been helpful. And we've come across a couple of them that are actually Rotman alums that started from Rotman also, right? So there's a lot of room for things like that. So if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, Rotman also has that kind of environment to help you kind of groom it. So I'm sure Chris can talk more on it from the school's point of view. I'm talking more on it from the student's point of view. I don't know if that's helpful though. Uh, yeah, I, that's really helpful. Uh, that's great. Like I said, I think if you're interested in tech and anyone here in tech or startups, absolutely. I mean, I think, again, our program is not a technical like MBA, right? You, what you what the, the idea would be that you would come here with some of that kind of knowledge. <clears throat> but what we give you is the tools to be able to maybe scale up a startup idea, right? To bring it to market. I think that's what me and Femi have been pretty consistent saying. And that's what the CDL typically does. We're not there to help you sort of generate an idea. You kind of come with the idea. One of the things I think is really great is there's opportunities to intern with startups, right? So you can go and work with an early stage startup. And again, sometimes they have money to pay you, which is great. Uh, some of our students have gone on when they graduate to work for a startup, right? Maybe this they have money and they're able to, you know, and we have quite a few alum um, and for not the ones that were featured in my presentation, unfortunately, but obviously Toronto, I mean, MBA is there's 275 students, very diverse, right? So I've kept it focused on our Africans, but some of our Nigerians are now working in entrepreneurship and tech as well. Um, yeah, Rotimi is a good example from Nigeria. And also the key for you would be to, to participate in the CDL elective in second year that I don't believe Doton or Femi are doing, but that is a key elective for you to take right because you actually work for one of the startups you become part of their business for nine months right so that that is why i would say great place to come if you're interested in entrepreneurship want to do something when you graduate or at least it's like it's a it's a midterm or future goal um you're in you're in a really great environment right uh in toronto for that okay we'll go on to some more questions because there's lots here and all right, and thank you, Chris. I'm going to allow Rume to go straight ahead. Hello, guys. Good evening. 
Um, Good evening, Rona. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Femi, Dr. and Chris. This has been very insightful. Um, I have two questions because most of my questions have been answered um, by Dr. and Chris or Femi as they spoke and with the last question as well. My first question is about application fee waivers. Um, well, the Naira is naira so like almost 200 Canadian dollars is, you know, quite up there. And I was wondering if um, Rotman um, allows application fee waivers and in what um, on what basis is that available to applicants? That's the first question. And um, I, I have, I can ask two, right? Yeah, yeah that's true. Okay, okay. And then the second question is this. So um, I'm a quantity of your practice in Nigeria and with um, a lot of people on this call would probably relate to this. Um, in most of the um, courses we took uh, as, as Nigerian undergrads, there were lots of um, broad courses which, did not allow specialization early. And because they were broad, they were confusing, we were running around trying not to fail. And that kind of dragged some GPs down a lot, especially in engineering and environmental sciences. And I was wondering, um, or rather, I would like to confirm though, that the um, requirements, um, the last two years are the most important, right? Because by the time we start specializing in our fourth and fifth year, we are able to streamline and do better. And so you see someone yeah. who had who was struggling in the first two years or three have like 4.0 GPAs for 400 and 500. So I was wondering if, if the total GPA is not so great and then, you know, you we can look at the last two years uh, is is it a good idea to apply or should we just say, you know, Rotman is high up there and I shouldn't bother because, well, the average that I see as the GPA for everyone um, doesn't come close to what okay. <laughs> I'm spotting over here. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. All right. So good question. I think you asked a great question that I think will apply to lots of people. So thank you for that. Uh, first one, application fee waivers. Yes, we do offer application fee waivers. I think. Um, Elizabeth may have put something in the chat box about that. I think there's um, certainly, if you obviously fill out the attendance form, that's a good start. Um, one of the things I would also say to all of you on the call, and there's a lot of you, is we tend to offer application fee waivers to people maybe we've had a conversation with one-on-one, -on -one, they've sent us the copy of their resume, we've already got a good idea of their profile, their GMAT or GRE score or CFA, and we feel confident that by offering an application fee waiver, they're going to move forward in, in to the next stage. So it's not blanket offer. It requires you to also do a little bit of work up front in communicating with us, sending your resume, maybe, certainly, uh, having a conversation with me ahead of time, and just really kind of getting a sense that this is definitely the right move for you, and you're going to certainly move through to an interview stage. So yes, the answer is yes to application fee waivers, but there's a little bit of work to get that. Um, with regards to undergraduate grades, I think what you have to say to yourself is, if your grades don't quite hit the mark, and, and I do understand that certainly from, I mean, I'm from the UK where obviously, you know, the grading scale there, it's um, similar to, I think, to Nigeria and Ghana in that you can, you can get like a B, or something and it's like a really good grade <laughs> but in Canada that's not doesn't translate very well so we do try and kind of work on you know how is the grading work in certain countries compared to say others uh, and how do we try and compare that to the U of T scale so you may find that what you think is not great grades in your final year still meets our standards but if the grades are not great then you're going to be relying on your GMAT or GRE right so if you if you get a really good GMAT or GRE score, it's an indication to us that you're still going to be able to get through the academic rigor. To anyone on the call here, if your GMAT is in the 500s and your GRE is in the 200s and you didn't do, didn't have great grades in your undergrad, it's going to be tough for you to get into Rotman and possibly other top schools. Because like I said, it's an academic program that you're applying to, right? Therefore, the, the, the academic assessment of our admissions process is still very important and very important to faculty <laughs> actually so you have to also be truthful to yourself but definitely I think um, don't get too hung up on grades as long as you feel that you're you're close 
and you've got a good GMAT or GRE, then you're going to be in a position of strength. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you, Rumer. I'm going to move on to Atika. Uh, okay, uh, good, evening. good evening. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, Dotsu, and Femi. Uh, this is really an insightful section. Uh, I just have two questions to ask. Uh, what's the period or what's the duration if one sends in an application say, um, for the MBA program and uh, the GMAT score are not been forwarded yet? What's the waiting period like? Is it up to a month or two or a week? And also, uh, can someone with a postgraduate diploma certificate in uh, engineering apply for your program after a first degree of HND, then second degree of post? graduate diploma in mechanical engineering apply to Rotman? Mm, yeah, good question about the HND. I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that. On If it's equivalent to a degree, all the courses that you've done, um, it may be possible. But again, again I, don't, I, I don't know for sure. Um, that might be a case by case basis. Um, and oh sorry i forget the other the other part of the question okay well, what i said is was, okay you can go ahead article. okay what i said is the first uh, degree of iron national diploma in mechanical engineering and a second degree of postgraduate diploma in mechanical engineering can i apply for MBA? i don't know yeah that's a great question i'm not too sure i'd have to check with our school of graduating studies around that um depends if you consider it to be the equivalent of a degree um and if it is it's certainly possible yeah yeah and secondly what's the waiting period if i send in my application and my G gre score is not yet uh, yeah. the exam yet what's the waiting yeah. period until you've got the score <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah so it could sit for six months it could sit for a week um so yeah so definitely um, you can apply without those scores, but we probably won't be able to do much with the application because obviously it's a, it's a requirement for, for our MBA program. So the key would always be to look to complete everything before submitting an application. And obviously any application fee waiver, if you're looking for one, we're not gonna offer that until we have seen that you have everything complete. Um, but we do, we do, even though you can see the application deadlines now on the screen, we do have like a rolling application for Africa, so you can apply anytime. And if your application is good, I'm gonna be looking at applications on a daily basis. So even if you miss say the October 3rd deadline, you know, and you apply in November, there's still a good, there's very, very strong chance if you're a good applicant, we'll be reviewing it within a week of submission and within two or three weeks of submission, you could get an answer. Um, Doton, how long was your sort of waiting period before you got an offer and applying, can you remember? Um, I know I applied just around New Year, and I can't forget the day I got the um I got the call February twenty third or so twenty third yeah I was in the middle of a meeting and then yeah <laughs> so yeah. um about a month yeah a month yeah. and a half yeah so and that that's seems quite a long time i'm sorry doton yeah. Yeah. maybe i sat in your application too long okay damn I, I, I think chris i think <laughs> mine mine was like uh two weeks all right okay yeah because i i can remember i i know i wrote the exam on the 3rd of september i reached out to you okay i followed everything the exam then you gave me the application fee waiver yeah <laughs> when i finally wrote the gmat there you then, go right <laughs> femi is a good example yeah, yeah. I, I, I know, told you I, I give waivers, but you just got to show me your GRE or GMAT first. Yeah. So I think I, I sent in my application the last day in September. Yeah. Yeah. And I got my offer on the 16th of October. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we are we want to be quick, right? If you've got an application that's complete and it's good, we'll be quick, right? We we're not a school that's going to keep you waiting for like some decision day that we've decided is going to be in December or March. No, Rotman, we will make decisions on a weekly basis. That's how we roll. And that's our commitment, I think, to, to not, you know, 
we're not arrogant enough as a school to keep people waiting right for a decision day you know we, we don't believe that's a good approach sometimes it can mean you get offers in your hand well ahead of other schools though so that's maybe the downside is that you, you're waiting for a decision from a typically a u.s school and you have to wait a couple of months but again we can always work together on on that so we give you that space and freedom to consider all your offers um we do offer scholarships in round one, of course, and round two and round three. Uh, that's a question, I think, from Rumi on the chat. Um, that's a great question, by the way. So scholarships is not a bottomless pool, right? So if you apply early and any time between now and, say, December, obviously there's lots of money in the pot. If you apply in round two, which would be in January, so January, February time, which is also a good time to apply, still plenty of scholarship money. We don't recommend round three or round four, which you can see on the screen here, simply because the scholarship money does run low and it's giving you your, you don't have much time then, if accepted, to get your visa and things. So we really encourage any time between now, like today, I interviewed two candidates from Nigeria this week um, and probably mid-February. It's probably your best timelines to apply if people had questions around application timelines. Um, yeah. All right, then. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Chris. Uh, so I'm going to move on to Mujisola. There's still a question in the chat box. But I think Femi will be better positioned or better to answer. Um, have students been able to get a loan to cover the entire or almost the entire tuition balance after scholarship? Of the, I think this is around student loans. Yeah. So finance. Yeah. Tell me, please, just a quick one. Um, Chris, I know yeah. you mentioned um, mm -hmm. initially that you have a hard stop at 4.15. Is that still the case? Uh, yeah, I've got a couple more minutes, but, okay, um, awesome. but honestly, if if Doton and Femi are OK, they can field a lot of answers to questions. Hopefully we've answered a lot around applications and admissions. So maybe if 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 people have questions yeah, around funding, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the, the peer to peer experience of getting here, why they chose Canada, did they choose Canada over US or UK? Uh, if people have questions around what it's like to be a student or be an African living in Toronto, I mean, that would be a great way to spend the last sort of 10, 15 minutes. Because for those on the call, you can maybe see by my badge, I'm a football coach and um, I have to go and coach my team very, very shortly. So hopefully everyone, you know, you're from Africa. You must please. You must love football. You, you can sympathize that I have, uh, it's it's my second job outside of Rotman. So uh, I am gonna sign off very, very shortly. But if there's one more question that you think would be applicable to admissions officer, happy to answer that. And then Femi and Doton, you guys okay carrying? Hi. <laughs> yeah, they're good. They're good, I trust them, they're the best. Awesome, thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, um, just, just before, you guys answer. I want Mujisola to ask a question. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to Chris, um, Femi and Dodson. Thank you so much. The session has been quite informative. Um, so this question is um, particular to me um, and it's, um, it's on the class profile. Um, I remember Chris mentioned that um, when he showed the, the class profile, something about the age range and then the years of experience and all that. Because um, for me, um, my dream has been to go to a business school, um, but it's looking like my years of experience is kind of working against me right now. Cause you know, I've had a couple of inquiries and you know, just talk to people generally or perhaps send my CV to a business school. And then you just hear that, oh, you've had more than a decade of um, years ex um, of experience. Like, you know, I've had more than 10 years. Then I should just look at the executive MBA. But um, truthfully for me, the executive MBA does not, you know, uh, particularly fit into what I want to achieve with a full uh, time MBA. So I want to know, do you have consideration for people that, I mean, that have more than 10 years of experience and perhaps, you know, they are older than 36 years like you mentioned on the class profile that you know you you projected earlier on that's my question thank you yeah it's, it's a tricky one and a sensitive one unfortunately um it's going to be tough right it's just going to be tough for you i'm really sorry 
because again the the the, the, ju- the how we sort of justify this is our program and maybe Doton and Femi can allude to this, our program by design, right, is for people at an earlier stage of, of their career and their professional life, right? So most of our students are in, you know, in their 20s. Um, and when you look at our students from across other parts of the world, they're, they're even younger, right, 24, 25. Our employers that come to recruit from our program are looking to recruit students at a certain stage of their life and their career so the kind of job profiles and the kind of student profiles they're looking for are primarily for people still at that earlier stage of their career so what we can't do is have people coming in and then they get frustrated because there are no opportunities they're frustrated because no one will take them on as an intern right if you're in your late 30s or into your 40s it's very difficult to get an internship at that point in your life it's just a reality and we can't change that right so we have to be honest with who we admit right we we don't want to have people come in and they're frustrated because they can't get internships or therefore the people looking to hire them are they're like you're just too experienced for the job we have even if you genuinely believe you're like i don't mind doing that internship they won't hire you so that's where the frustration comes even if you're comfortable taking on these roles right? They, they may not hire you. So that is, you know, this comes through years of experience of knowing where we're pitching our, our program. And unfortunately, even though you don't want to do an executive program, that's probably where you and others on this call might be at in your life. And you have to come to terms with those are the type of postgraduate programs and opportunities that you now have to accept. It's like me, if I wanted to go to Rotman, I couldn't, I'm too old. I would myself have to look at those types of programs even if I like I love Rotman I couldn't do it right I wouldn't get admitted so it's just unfortunate fact and you do have to come to terms with it and if you're getting responses from other schools you definitely need to pivot and really think about what can you do if you're looking for an overseas experience we do have candidates from Africa and Nigeria in some of our executive and global executive programs right um so we do have have candidates from across the world in those programs. So it's it's unfortunate. It, it feels like oh, I've missed the boat, but it's it's tricky. It's very tricky. And so we don't want you entering into an, an admissions process or even applying when it's not going to go any further. Um, so that's really I de- definitely don't want to fi- finish on a negative comment. Um, so uh, but it, I'm just again. I think hopefully today, me, Doton and Femi have been truthful and honest about the Rotman experience, about scholarships, what it costs, and then really the experiences and ages that we that are going to be successful. Okay, do we have any other questions? I'm going to have to sign off in a, in a minute or two. All right, then. Thank you, Chris. Um, so, hands are raised, but I want to take one of the questions in the chat box now. Um, a lot of the que- I'm going to be able to answer some of the questions, but there's an interesting question regarding diversity. Uh, are there any important things for to note for students who have dual citizenship? For example, Nigerian now also has a German citizenship. Does that count as anything during the application process? Uh if you're a Canadian citizen, <laughs> it will count, or a Canadian permanent resident and dual citizen, that will count for a lot uh, because obviously it reduces your fees. But if you're a dual citizen of Nigeria and look like Germany from the chat box there, that's amazing, especially if you've lived and worked in Germany because you've got international, you may have some international experience, which is we always love as well, um, could strengthen your application, but it won't if impact the fee, the cost, you'd have to have Canadian citizenship or Canadian permanent residency in addition to your home country. Yeah. With that, um, Temi and Elizabeth, I am unfortunately going to sign out. Um, I have put my email address quite a few times in the chat box, but I know you guys also have my email address and maybe we can touch base this week because one thing I would say to all of you is I welcome the opportunity to talk to any of you on the call here 
one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, again, through Zoom like this. Uh, all I ask of you is email me with your resume. If you have a GMAT or a GRE, send that as well. Um, yeah, there's my email address. And then, um, you know, based on taking a quick look at your resume and your profile, um, we can set up a call for a chat. Uh, and then there's opportunities for us then to discuss things like application fee waivers. So, you know, we absolutely encourage people to consider Toronto, to consider Rotman and consider Canada as a place to come and spend some time uh, because we do think we offer a lot here in Canada, um, a lot of advantages. And um, hopefully today has given you a bit of an insight into that and uh, you know, welcome that opportunity. I may be visiting Ghana and Nigeria at the end of October. So anyone on the call in those two countries who you know, I, can, I chat with between now and then, there may be opportunities to meet with me in person as well. Uh, tell me if you're in Nigeria, um, you know, I'll let you know when I'm coming. Um, so with that, I'm gonna sign off. If you wanna keep the conversation going for another five or 10 minutes, please feel free to ask our students questions. Um, they're very knowledgeable and uh, yeah, maybe they can share their stories about their journey from Nigeria to, to Toronto. But with that, i got to go and coach football, guys. So, um, you know, thanks so much for your time. All right, then, Chris. Thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to seeing you in Nigeria. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks, everybody, for your time as well today and, and thinking of Rotman. Awesome. Okay. Straight away, um, Dotsun and Femi, thank you for choosing to stay behind. So there's still a couple of hands up with questions. I'm going to allow Touch and Pay straight away ask a question. Uh, touch and Pay. Um, sorry, sorry. my name is Michael. I apologize for the Touch and Pay Technologies name showing. All right, and thank um, you, Michael. Thank you very much. I think my question is somewhat very similar to um, Mojisola's question uh, in part, but a bit with a bit of a twist. Um, so she rightly stated that, um, or she right, rather she asked that she has a bit of experience and age. But my own is so imagine I have a bit of experience, um, not up to ten years though. Does it affect? So I run a startup company. In, Nigeria, um, and I have a bit of experience in the entrepreneurship world. Does it affect applying? Does it mean that I have to move to the MBA or I can still apply for this program? And does it affect any prospect? I mean, that's my own question. Okay, um, I can take a stab at this. Um, so you let me understand your question perfectly. You have a little less than 10 years experience. I'm interested in applying to Rodman for the full-time MBA, and you're concerned yes. that this may be an obstacle, right? Uh, um, so from Moji's question, um, she's, okay. um, the, the way Chris answered it was um, the over qualification might not, I mean, I could understand from the age perspective, mm -hmm. but from the qualification perspective, does it affect any... Um, um, so qualification and age, so like um, Chris mentioned, uh, if, if you have less than 10 years, you should be fine because I had just about 10 years experience just at the dot of 10 years when I applied. Um, so, or no, it was nine plus actually. It was nine plus years when I applied. So if you have a little less than 10 years experience, you should be fine. And again, let me add the caveat that Ultimately, everything depends on the admissions um, committee. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem. And the reasoning behind having um, a limit to the years of experience and the age is that, like Chris explained, uh, a lot of the job opportunities for MBA interns and MBA grads are targeted at people who are in the earlier stages of their careers. So by the time you are hitting more than 10 years, you're already getting to like mid-level and the opportunities for MBA grads and MBA interns are not as um, as many. So to answer your question, you could still give it a shot if you have less than 10 years experience. It's left to the admissions committee to, to decide. Or you could reach out to Chris, send him an email after this. But yeah, I so I'd, I'd also add to that. So on the aspect of um, running your own business, so like I know I answered this same kind of question earlier. I think it does more good than 
you think actually because when you have your own your own business and you come in during the whole application process or during the conversations you have the room to actually tell the school okay this is what i do this is what i'm looking out for and you know chris mentioned something there's no separate um, application for scholarships or for fellowships right so it's during the course of the conversation people that are interested in maybe continuing in the path of their own startups, joining a startup or doing this. So they indicated during the conversation and that's when people get drafted into the likes of the CDL fellowship, where you get to have access to an incubator for your startup, right? So I think the best thing that you can do at this point will be just reach out to Chris. He's a very open person. Send him an email saying, okay, Chris, I'd love to have a chat. This is my current situation and what do you think? But I'm sure he will be very interested in actually having a conversation with you because those are the kind of people he looks out for. I don't know if that's answers your question clearly. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate the answer. Problem. Thank you very much, Femi. Thank you very much, Dutsu. Um, Jibril, Jibril Agbabiaka, you can ask your question. Thank you very much, guys, for putting this together. It's been a really insightful session. Um, I joined a little late, so I don't know if um, the question I'm about to ask has been addressed already. But what I'm trying to optimize for uh, for this MP MBA program is um, mostly funding. You know, for top school programs, I'm also looking out for full funding. So I, I wanted to ask if there's opportunity for a full ride in Rotman School of Business. Um, I, I, I can continue there. Yes. If, like the, the simple answer is yes, there's opportunity for it. I, I, I know I know someone close to me in my class had a full ride from Nigeria, or rather two people, if I'm not mistaken, right? So yes, the simple answer is yes. But like Chris rightly said, there's no separate application. So Rotman looks at your application holistically. So it's a mix of your last two years in undergrad, a mix of your work experience, not just quantity of the experience, but rather the quality, right? What you do. And it's also how well you articulate this work experience in your resume, then the spike factor essay, then the referral. So when you bring everything together, then add your GMAT or GRE. So the, the Rotman tends to look at everything as a single application. Then they determine, okay, this person's application is strong enough. We should be able to give up to X, Y, Z. But yes, people get full-time, um, full scholarships for the entire program. And I know people from Nigeria that have gotten it and they keep getting it, so. Well, thank you very much. This answers my question. Thank you. You're welcome. And then um, there are a couple of questions still in the chat box. There's a question regarding, um, does the Rotman School accept West evaluated results? Uh, that's an interesting question. I know I was contemplating it during my time, but I ended up not using it. I think it, it would be best to shoot Chris a mail with this question. Okay, Chukwe yeah. Buka. Yeah. This kindly notes on Chris's um, email. Or Dotun, okay. if you have anything on that, you can help. I'm not sure if I'm not sure what's going on. It's like Timmy froze a bit, or was it my connection? Well, I think it was your connection. We can hear you clearly. Okay. All right. So, Dutton, did you hear the question about the West? That was. Does Rotman School accept West evaluated results? Um, I've actually not heard that happening in my experience about okay. West. I mean, you just send your transcript directly to to Rotman, and that's it. Uh, so they they don't they they need the transcripts from your school. Um, I don't think they care about West of evaluation. So, so my guess is no, just send your transcripts. All right, thank you. There's a question around, is a round two application open to scholarship consideration? I think Chris has answered that several times. Okay. Yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, there's also a question, if early round application guarantee, if, if that guarantee you an interview, who does it guarantee to get an interview? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, nothing guarantees you an interview except the strength of your application. So it doesn't matter at what point you apply. I mean, of course, because you want to um, go in when the pool is empty, uh, 
so that you know the competition is not as stiff. There's still a lot more scholarship opportunities, so it's good to apply early. But nothing guarantees you an invite to interview, except how strong your application is. Your the, the different factors that we've spoken about already: uh, your GMAT diary, your resume, your essay, everything. That's what guarantees you an interview um, invite. Okay. So there's also yeah. a question regarding. Okay. No, no, I was, I was going to say, Timmy, I think I saw a question earlier about loans to cover the scholarship. Yeah, I that's, can't that's, find it that's what I'm going to. So oh, okay. uh, have students been able to get a loan to cover the entire or almost entire tuition balance after scholarship or without scholarship? So I think it's just trying to figure out the options with financing. If you are taking a full loan or if you have to like, how does it work in Canada? It's Okay, so I, I can talk based off my own experience and conversations with my colleagues and Dotton can also chime in, right? So um, right now I know to school in Canada, pretty much the kind of loans available are uh, um, Empowered and Prodigy Finance, right?